All right, everyone have a Bible? I want you to open up to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, hallelujah. Glory to God. Now tonight I want to encourage you, I want to remind you of some things. Wednesday night people is fun to teach with Wednesday night people because you all know the word. You know everything there is to know about the word. You don't have to explain much because you know. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I've heard that. You know, this is just one book, but we should be looking at it all the time. Every day, look at it, get some word in you. Every morning, every day, whatever's your time, get some word in you. Well, I just looked at that last week. I heard pastor preach that the other day. I saw it. Read it. Look at it. Get some word in you. you. That's something we have to do every day. So in Luke chapter 13 and verse 10, it says, Now he, that'd be Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had an inf- a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and, and, in, and could no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now I want to I want to point out something interesting here. In so many scriptures, when you see uh, people receiving healing in their body or whatever uh, their need being met, very often Jesus says, "Your faith has made you whole. Your faith did this." But this time, this woman sitting here in his meeting, and he saw her and called her out, and he laid hands on her, and. He said, woman, you're loosed. And verse 13, and and laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. Uh, A ruler of the synagogue, Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue, and the job that they have, uh, that they had among other things, was to make sure that the the service was in proper order, that everything was being done right. So when Jesus laid hands on this woman and raised her her up, you know, she was bent over, and he he loosed that thing, and and she stood up. This guy didn't say to Jesus, he says to the crowd, hey, we can't be doing this on the Sabbath. This should only be done through the week, not on the Sabbath. So this is what he's doing. So then the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrite. Go ahead, turn to your neighbor and say, you, no. (laughs) The Lord answered him and said, hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away into water? So ought not this woman, say ought not this woman. Being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame and all the multitude rejoiced for, for all the glorious things that were done by him. I want you to know this. You'll see the word loosed or loose in here three times. And what's interesting is he says, when he, when he tells the woman, you're loosed from your infirmity, he's equating that to a guy loosing his donkey or his ox to lead it out the water. Why? Because... She was bound by Satan and your donkey or your ox is bound somehow. It's tied up somewhere. And he's saying, you know, he's equating that. It's, it's like, it's, it's what's harder to do, 
Say, woman, you're loose from this infirmity, or you go and loose your ox or your donkey, and you lead it out. But I want you, I want you to see this verse 16. So ought not this woman, this is what he says to him, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, to be loosed of this bond on the Sabbath. What is a daughter of Abraham? A daughter of Abraham. You'll see this through scripture. There's, um, there's a spiritual side and a physical side. The physical side is their descendants of Abraham. In fact, Jesus uh, later on, you know, he, he told them, if you were, if Abraham was your father or you're a descendant of Abraham, then you would be doing the same, same things that Abraham does, but you're not. He says, in fact, you're like your father, the what? The devil. So there was, what, what you could, how you could look at this is physical descendants of Abraham. And then there's this spiritual side that this woman represented. A woman, a daughter of Abraham who had this infirmity and was bound with this thing. Now turn over to Galatians chapter 3. I got too many markers. Galatians chapter 3. And verse 7. It says, therefore, know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. Galatians 3, 7. Are we of faith? Are you of faith? I ask, I ask you at the beginning, you know, are you a believer? Are you a Christian? If we are of faith, then according to this verse, we are the sons of Abraham. Sons and daughters. Of Abraham. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Verse 9 So then, those who are of faith, say, I am of faith, are blessed with believing Abraham. This is a spiritual sight. Now, you may not be a direct descendant of Father Abraham, but we are in a spiritual sense. And according to these verses, we are blessed in the same way that Abraham was blessed. So, verse 9, so then uh, those who are of faith, that's me and you, we're of faith, we're born again, we're children of God, we are blessed with believing Abraham, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not a faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. You know, you read a mouthful in some of these verses, and you're wondering... You know, what's going on here? <laughs> what's going on? Verses 10 through 12. There's two things really being described in these verses. The first one is, uh, is people trying to be right in the sight of God by what they do. Trying to be right by what you do. And you know what? This is a problem among people today. Trying to be right with God based upon what they do. Now, how many of you ever wondered this? You've known somebody, you've heard, maybe you've heard someone say this, uh, you've wondered this yourself. You know, grandma so-and-so was such a powerful woman of God. She uh, was a blessing to the house of God. She was involved in things all her life, all through church and up, but, but she died of this sickness. How can that happen? She done all these wonderful things. Anybody ever heard that? You wondered that? You heard somebody say that? What you're really saying is, why didn't all these things that she done get her healed? 
When in fact, we got to be looking at what he did to get us healed. It's not because she lived a good life and done great things. Because your good works and the things that you do in this life are important. We'll be rewarded for those things. But those aren't the things that bring blessing, bring healing, and bring victory to our lives. It's what Jesus done. And, so, and it's always being conscious of the fact and knowing that I'm a child of God, my Redeemer lives, and it's because of Him that I'm blessed. It's because of Him that healing belongs to me. It's because of Him prosperity belongs to me. It's because of Him my needs are met. It's because not based upon I'm just such a great guy. Janine's the only one in here who thinks I'm... Do you? Do you, do you think I'm a... It's been 37 years. <laughs> we got married in study hall. <laughs> Just about. Amen. So number one is trying to be right in the sight of God by what they do. This is, one, this is a couple things they're talking. Number two is believing you are right in the sight of God based upon what Jesus has done. So that's what he's summing up in these two verses. It's what Jesus had, has done for us. And then let's go on here. Verse 12, verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. You ever heard these verses before? Having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, that's you and I, because we're not direct descendants of Abraham, Somebody might be. That the blessing of Abraham might become a, come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Through, through faith. Christ has redeemed us from the curse. If he has redeemed us from the curse, he has given us this blessing. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Now, here's two things I want to talk about right now. Blessing and curse. Blessing and curse. A curse is this. It means to be damned. To be doomed. Dedicated to destruction. Not unlucky. There, let me help you with something. There's no such thing as luck. Even though it's a word that we use all the time. Most people do. I've only very recently caught myself saying it. This is a definition. I actually looked it up today in a dictionary, regular dictionary, for luck. This is what it means. The force that seems to operate for good or ill in a person's life as in shaping circumstances, events, or opportunities. There is no faith in that, in that definition. It's a, form, it's a force that seems to operate. And then, like every good dictionary, they give you an example in a sentence. You know, they'll, they'll have a sentence, the word in a sentence. And this is what it said. The sen this is the sentence according to the dictionary I was looking at. It says, with my luck, I'll probably get pneumonia. <laughs> that was the actual sentence the dictionary used to use the word luck. Why did it use a sentence like that? Because that's the way people talk. Just my luck. Ah, you know, here's, here's some... Here, here's, here's a few ways we use that word, word. People are down on their luck. Or you're in luck. Let me know if you heard this one. Luck of the draw. It's the luck of the draw. Or you're out of luck. Or this is your lucky day. I used that one time. A man ran out of gas out on our road. I saw the car out there. I was outside. And he come, come over there, he saw me out. I mean, there's nobody that lives around us, so he wasn't going to go anywhere else. And 
He says, I ran out of gas over here. Do you have any gas? I said, yeah. So I, get, I, get, I said, you know what? There's only, I'm shaking the can. There's only a little bit in there. And he's digging his pockets. He says, well, the, he says, the smallest bill I have is a five. I said, this is your lucky day. This gasoline's only $5. <laughs> <laughs> He said, well, okay. I said, no. <laughs> I give it to him. But this was his lucky day. This is a word that we use. A lot of people use it a lot. And we shouldn't be. It doesn't mean nothing. You're blessed. You're not lucky. You're blessed. You are blessed. Well, it seems like I'm being cursed. It seems like somebody put a curse on me. No, you're blessed. According to the word, you believe the word. You believe that when God said something that you're blessed. You're not bound. You're not stuck. You're not bound up. See, many people, many Christians believe that um, they're bound when they're really free. Now, I found a if you get uh, Rick Renner's um, daily devotion, it's free. If you want to get it, it, I get it every day. But I don't know what day this was from. I looked it up. But he gives a story. And he says, a friend of mine had a goat that he dearly loved. I don't know. Maybe somebody, you have a goat that you really love. Did you show goats? Okay. Do you have a love for goats? Did you have? So it does happen. Okay. I never had goats. <laughs> well, anyway, this friend had a goat that he loved. It says, very late one night, he received a telephone call from the local police who informed him that his goat had wandered away from home and had been hit by a car and now lay dead in a ditch by the side of the road. He says, my friend was grieved and brokenhearted, but he knew he needed to retrieve the dead goat. When he approached the ditch where the goat lay, he saw that the goat was very much alive. Its legs were bound with rope, which let, let my friend know that someone had kidnapped the goat and then dumped it in the ditch on the side of the road. So he jumped to the bottom of the ditch, pulled out his pocket knife, cut the rope, slapped the goat on his backside and said, get up. But the goat just laid there with his legs still clinging to each other as if they were still bound with rope. He hit her a second time, then a third time, then he yelled at her one last time, get up. So my friend mused to himself, bless this dumb old goat, it's free and doesn't even know it. <laughs> he reached down and pulled apart the goat's legs, then he lifted it and set it on its feet. Only then did the goat realize it wasn't bound anymore. He says, then he goes on to say, when I heard this story, it made me think about us as believers. We don't need to get free. We are free. Jesus worked on the cross, totally purchased. His work on the cross totally purchased our redemption and freedom. Amen? What is redemption? What does it mean that we've been redeemed? And, and we often hear, well, it means to buy back. This term used... Uh, in the New Testament. And that is what it means. But this is a term that was used during the slave trades. And what would happen was, if you went to the slave auction, and there was someone there that their purpose was to buy a slave, and then once they bought them and had ownership of them, they set them free. They give them their freedom. So if you were ever a slave down at the uh, slave auction, you would want to be bought by the guy that was going to redeem you and get you out of that bondage and into freedom. That's exactly what Jesus done for us. That's what he done. He paid the price. He paid it. He bought us out of that. The punishment that he took is what we deserved. It's what belonged to us. See, this is the gospel. This is the gospel message. 
But sometimes we need to be reminded of it because what happens so many times in our Christian walk, man, I feel bound. I'm not blessed. That person's blessed. You know, Diana's blessed all the time. And look at me. I got this going on. What's she doing to get blessed? It's not what she done. It's what he done. It's what he done. But you see, that's our mindset so many times, so much. What can I do to receive blessing from heaven? The only thing you need to do is get in position to receive it because it belongs to you. I filled my truck up with gasoline today before it got too high. Every place was over $3. We found a place for two something. I said, I'm filling up. I pulled in there. And you know what? I actually had to pull in to the gas station and stop. And you know how I got gas? I actually had to, you know... Some of you remember back when Jerry used to run out there and pump it for you <laughs> or one of his people that worked for him. But I actually had to do it. I had in order for my truck to get filled up with gasoline, I had to get it in a position to receive it. I had to do something. It's an act of faith when you do something. When you're, when, you're, when you're believing God for something and you're, and you're just, you're, what, what, what do I do? What do I do? It's not about, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the church and do this or I'm going to go to the church and do that. No, it's not about that. It's not about the good works. It's putting forth an effort and getting in position to receive it. Yes. That's what it is. Well, I don't know what to do. It's right here. It's all in the book. It's all in the book. Everybody's circumstances are different. Everybody's situations are different, but we all have the same master and we all have the same Bible. We all have the same word of God that brings us freedom. And a lot of times we got to find out, especially, listen, Wednesday night people, Wednesday night people, we're big enough to be able to find out for ourselves, to be able to get in prayer and study the word of God, read the Bible, read it. it does, well, I've heard that before. Read it. Because he'll speak to you. This is God speaking to us. He'll speak to your heart. It'll, do, it'll make a difference in your life when you do that. Listen to it. Hear it. You know, there are so many. We have no excuse in this age that we live in and in this country that we're in. We have no excuse to go without the word of God. None. It's, it, it's available to us everywhere. You can listen to it. You can read it. But you're not cursed. You're blessed. We had a, I know I've told this one maybe in class. Um, we've got a dog we had years ago. And now over the years, many years ago when I was Luke's age, and I had a family when I was your age. <laughs> we had a dog. And we had the dog house, and next to the dog house was a tree. So what do you do? You put a chain around the tree, hook it to the dog. Probably not allowed doing that today. Somebody would probably call the authorities on me now for that, but that's, what, <laughs> that's just how it was. So, you know, over the years, uh, you know, a dog or two later, and the chain broke. And the chain... Uh, it had the hasp on it that you hook on the, or the latch that you hook on the collar. And then there was about a three or four foot length of the chain. Well, we had this old, uh, uh, he was a Newfoundland. His name was Chief. Some of you knew Chief. But in his old age, you know, he got, he got, you know, tired like they do, sleep and eat is all. And I could call big chief over to me no matter where I was at in that yard with that four foot chain and when I latched it on his collar he would stay right there because he thought he was bound I remember the one time I didn't do that a whole lot but I remember the one time I'm mowing the grass I called him over underneath a shade tree come here he comes running over there. I, latched, I mowed my whole yard, and he laid there under that shade tree. When I got done, I went over there and unhooked it and said, there you go, buddy. And he took off running. Uh, hooked to nothing. 
He thought he was bound. He thought, but guess what? He really wasn't. He really wasn't. I, I mean, that's, that's an animal doing that. People do that. People are that way. Well, this is the hand that I was dealt in life. Oh, come on. <laughs> You've heard that. Well, this is just how it's going to have to be, I guess. No, no, no. Curse means to be damned, to be doomed, dedicated to destruction. People use that word too loosely. The world is what I mean. You know what I mean? You, uh, you're wrenching on a bolt, your, bo your wrench slips, you hit your thumb on something, you go, oh, I'm blessed. No, you don't. You should. <laughs> blessed. Somebody drives up in a sharp car or they're dressed real sharp and they lean back and say, blessed. No, they don't say that. This word, damned, is used. And you know what it means? It's the curse. I curse you. You're putting, you're, are your words important? Do your words carry power? This thing, you know, you'll say this blank thing or this blank. No, you're cursing it. You say this blessed thing. You know what? In the midst, in the very midst of deciding what I'm going to do tonight. Yesterday, it's raining. I go to my back door, it's locked. So I'm getting, you know, trying to get back up against the house under the rain. I can open my garage door with my phone. So I get on there and I hit the thing and I hear the door going up and it's raining really hard. And so I go out around the corner and I go to run in the garage and the door was only up this high. <laughs> what an opportunity for me to curse that door. I could have, but I was in the midst of, of this. So I did nothing but chuckle to myself because, but it hurt. I mean, I didn't, you didn't even know that, did you? In fact, I was so concerned. I was looking to see if I warped the garage door. You know, I'm like, did I hit it that hard? Cause it sure seemed like it. Bam. So. So if you see a red mark up there, <laughs> but I had an opportunity to let that door know who was boss because I was going to curse it, but I didn't, I didn't, but you understand what I mean. Things like that happen and people, the words will start flying. Something will happen and, and there they go. So don't, don't, you're not down on your luck. You're not out of luck. You're not even in good luck. You are blessed. You are blessed. This is what blessed means. You know what the first word is for it is to be happy. Blessed is happy or highly favored. Listen, empowered to prosper. Marked for success. To be cursed is what? Dedicated to destruction. But if you're blessed... You are marked for success. God wants you and I to be successful. And I'm not just talking about a career or whatever. No, in life. He wants you to be successful in fulfilling the plan that he has set out before you. He's rooting for you. He wants you to stay on track because he knows you can do it. I don't know. I don't know if I can do this. Yes, you can. How do I know you can? Because you're here. You're a child of God. You are blessed. He's empowered you to do this. And not just carry out the plan that he has for you to be successful in it, but be happy the whole time you're doing it. That's why I chuckled, I guess, when I hit the door. Bam. No, you are empowered. I get this in you. Every day when you wake up, you declare it. I am blessed. My family is blessed. My home is blessed. My household's blessed. 
My job is blessed. What are you doing? You're declaring blessing over it so it can be successful, so it can be so it can succeed. And you're putting that on there. You're saying that you're bringing it about and it's going to be a part of you in your life. See, we've used it so loosely. Pastors mentioned that someone sneezes. Oh, bless you. Bless you. It's gotten to the point sometimes where that doesn't carry the, the, it doesn't carry the power. Because it's just been a, a, a kind of a, a habit to say that. Oh, bless you. Oh, bless you. You know, you might as well, you might as well just say old snicker bar. Or something like that. So it does about as good. Do you understand what I mean? Bless you. Bless you. Now, I'm not saying don't do that, and I'm not going to call you out if you say it. I mean, thank you. Because that's a lot of times that's what I'll say. Thank you. If you sneeze real loud or whatever, and somebody says, bless you. Thank you. Yeah, I receive that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some power and oomph behind that. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that, and I'll receive that, that blessing. Amen. Hallelujah. Now we're going to go over to Numbers. Numbers chapter 22. And I don't I know we're not going to get through this tonight. This would definitely be more than a couple nights. But um, Numbers chapter 22. I would encourage you to read this because you see, we're not even, we're not even going to get to Deuteronomy 28. And that's the one, man. That's the chapter. That's the one that talks about the, the blessing and the curses. That's where, that's where you get that. And, and you know, you'll be blessed if you obey the Lord. You'll be blessed with these things. If you don't obey and do what he says, you're going to be cursed. Not just blessed and cursed, but you'll be so blessed the blessing will overrun you, overtake you. If you obey and do what the Lord says. Chapter 22, Numbers 22, verse 1. Then the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab. On the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was exceedingly afraid. Why? Why was he afraid? He was afraid of the people because they were many. He's talking about Israel, the Israelites. He's, he's afraid of them. They come over here and there's a lot of them. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. He saw not just that there was a lot of them, but he saw that there was something on them. You understand what's going on here? The people the children of Israel are coming. Here's this king. They're coming close to his country. He's starting to get worried. Who are all these? Look at all these people. There's, they're everywhere. There's a multitude of these people. He didn't just see how many there were. He saw there was something on. Verse 4. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this company will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the, same, the son of Zippor, was, was king of the Moabites at that time. Then he sent messengers to Balaam. Now here's where Balaam comes in. The son of Beor, which is near the river. Uh, in the land of the sons of his people. To call him saying, look, a people has come from Egypt See, they cover the face of the earth and are settling next to me. Therefore, please come at once and do what to these people? Curse this people for me. For they are too many, too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed and he, and he whom you cursed is cursed. See, Balaam had a reputation. He was known by this king. He's concerned that all these, that all these people, the Israelites, look at all of them. They're getting too close to my land. They're getting too close to our country, our, my kingdom. So go get Balaam. Balaam's the guy that curses people and he blesses people. 
Go get him. So the elders, verse 7, the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hand. You know what that is? Money. So they're going to Balaam with money. And they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. And he said to them, lodge here tonight and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam and said, who are these men with you? So Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has, has sent to me saying, look, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth. Come now and curse them for me. Perhaps I, should, uh, perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. In other words, he's saying, if you'll curse these people, then I'll be able to drive them out. I will just whoop them and run them out. So just curse them. Just put a curse upon them. So this is what the, Balak's telling God, this is what they want. And God said to Balaam, Look at what he said. You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to these guys, go back to your land for the Lord's refused to give me permission to go with you. Good answer. Good answer. And the princes of Moab rose and went to, to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. They went back to the king. He don't want to come with us. So then he sent back the princes, more numerous and more honorable than they. And they came to him this second time they come to him. This is what Balak, son of Zippor, the king, please let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will certainly honor you greatly, and I will do whatever you say to me. This is what the king's message was to Balaam. Name your price. Just come. Whatever. Whatever it takes, just name your price. Now, let me ask you something. If someone approached you with something like this, you know what begins to happen? Your brain gets to go into work of things that you could do with that money, of things that you could, uh, you know, you know what, 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 what's really a bad deal is if someone's thinking, what if, what if Balaam said, wow, I'll go ahead and curse God's people, get all this money and dump this money back in the kingdom. See, that's the way some people think. Lord, if I just win the lottery, if I just win this, Hundred million. I'll I'll put half of it in the ministry. Oh come on. You're dreaming. You're you're dreaming. And this is kind of what what we see uh, taking place in this story. Um, oh, I don't know. I I could just read the whole thing, but I don't want to do that. Verse 19, now therefore, please, you also stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God, look at this. Now God came to Balaam at night and said, if the men come to call you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. Then God's anger was aroused because he went. Well, I thought he just told him to go. Didn't he just tell him? No. He said, if the men come to you, then you can go with them. But guess what? He got to thinking about those lottery winnings. He got to thinking about all that. He, he's excited about getting his winning ticket. It's a surefire winner. And I'm already spending the money before I've got it. Anybody do that besides me? Who's ever spent money before you got it? Don't raise your hand. I must be the only one. Oh, Janine's done that before. No. You spent it before, you know, it's burning a hole in your pocket. God's anger was aroused. 
Then it goes on and it talks about, you know, we got the first talk, talking donkey. I won't go through that. Let me just sum it up in this. Go to chapter 23. Numbers 23, verse 8. This is what God said. How I, how, this, is what, this is what Balaam's prophecy was. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. There a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. In other words, these people are coming in. And you know what? They're not going to have any neighbors. So you're not going to be around. These, he says, I can't curse these people. It's impossible for me to curse them. This is the problem that Christians have today. I hear this a lot. This, in, 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 you know, it's been said. People will use this term. Well, in my family, there's a generational curse. You ever heard that? Yeah. There's this thing going on. You know, it started. We don't know when it started, but, you know, grandma had it. You know, mom had it. Then, then uh, you know, my brother's got it. And I'll probably get it and my kids will get it. Generational curses. Let me tell you something, child of God, you that are blessed, it is impossible for that generational curse to stick on you because it cannot attach itself to something God has blessed. It can't. There's no place on you for it to go. No place. Now, I don't want you to get confused. I don't want to say confused. I just, just let me help you out with something. Don't equate curses with persecutions. They're not the same. Was Paul an apostle of Jesus? Yeah, he wrote most of the New Testament. So according to the word of God, Paul was a blessed man. Was Paul blessed? Did he face things? Did he face trials and you know, things going on? He faced persecutions, not curses. These were not curses. No one could curse him, just like no one can curse you. So don't believe that, you know, uh, I moved to this place and there must be a witch that lives next door to me. What do I do? Let the power of God move her out. You know, the power of God that's in you is greater than anything like that. They may be moving in next to you or upstairs or downstairs or whatever. You hear, you hear this. Don't, don't be afraid of that because guess what? Once you begin to fear that, it'll come upon you. This is where people miss it a lot of times. There's two places. One, we can be uninformed or ignorant about what the word actually says. Or we get in fear and the thing comes upon us. Because fear works just like faith, but is in, re in reverse. See, faith calls those things that be not as though they were. But then we start saying words like, oh, I was afraid that was going to happen. I'm fearing this thing. I'm afraid that this is going to happen to me. I don't want to do that because I'm afraid this will happen. You fear that thing and it'll get on you. That's when the doors open. That's when these things begin to, to be, begin to hinder you or to um, have an effect. Now, I'm not going to skip Brother Johnson's verses here. They're right here in chapter 23. I want to look at verse 16, though. It says, Then the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go back to Balak. And thus you shall speak. So he came to him. And there he was standing by his burnt offering. And the princes of Moab were with him. And Balak said to him, what has the Lord spoken? Then he took up his oracle and said, rise up, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie. 
nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed and cannot reverse it. We've heard these verses, haven't we? What's he talking about here? He's talking about the blessing. This is what this whole story brings. You know, I read this whole story a couple times in a, in a couple different versions. And that's, I can sit here and read the whole thing and you won't get out of it like I want you to. But this is what it sums up to be. It is impossible for a curse to come upon you because God has blessed you. God is not going to reverse what he's done. If you're a child of Abraham and then you're blessed, you are blessed. A child of God, you know, we're, we're, you, you understand what I'm saying? It's like we saw in Galatians 3. We are blessed with Abraham. The blessing of Abraham belongs to us. And if these blessings belong to us, no one can take that away from us. The only way that it's hindered is if you and I, if you and I do something. If we open the door to something. That's why in Deuteronomy 28, and I, that'll be your homework assignment, read that. Read that, and you'll see in these places. If, you know, God says uh, in, in Deuteronomy in, in verse, just in the first two verses there, he says, obey and be blessed. If you'll just obey me and do what I say, you'll be blessed. Then in verse 15, if you disobey, you'll be cursed. Now I'm going to go ahead and close with this. Proverbs 26. Proverbs Proverbs 26 and verse 2. It says, like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause shall not alight. So I, I, I want you to see this. You can read other versions to bring clarity out. But what he's actually saying is like the bird that flies over your head. To a child of God that is blessed... And what they do, you're blessed from, he does, he's declared you blessed. That cannot be removed from you. You obey the word of God. You do what he says. Any curse that tries to get on you is like a bird that flew overhead. It's not even going to affect you. It'll be like, well, what was that? You know, ah, whatever. Who pays attention to birds flying over unless they bomb you or something? <laughs> then you're looking up. You don't really pay attention. You know they're there. But how often do you really look at a sparrow flying by? Not really. So don't, see, th what this verse is really helping us with is don't be expecting a curse. Don't be expecting this generational thing to come upon me. Don't expect this sickness to, to attach itself to me. Don't do that. Every year this time, August, September, is when people have allergy symptoms. I had them the worst. And I'm here to tell you today that I was healed of it years ago. I'll be honest. Let me, let me I'm, yeah, I'm being honest with you. Now, let me say something that is so true. If this was uh, years ago when I suffered allergies so bad, I wouldn't be up here doing this tonight. That's how bad it was. My face would be all swelled up. My eyes swelled shut, couldn't breathe. Uh, prescriptions did nothing for me. It was only by the power of God that I received healing in my body to be free of it. But let me tell you something that happened for uh, several years after that. This season come around, I'd begin expecting it. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Wow, it's getting to the end of August. Uh, you know, September's right here. It's going to be, this thing's going to try to get back on me. You know what? It still tries to get back on me. 
But you know what I found out? It can't stick to me. It can't stay on me. There's no place for it to attach itself to me. Why? Because I'm just like you. I'm blessed. Amen. Let's stand.